Hello everybody, I'm Nick and today I want to talk to you about the 20 NuGet packages that I think that every software engineer working with .NET should be familiar with. By familiar, I mean you should know that they exist, you should know what they do, and you should know how to code with them. So, not just familiar, you should probably learn uh, quite a bit about them. Uh, this list is not something I just pulled out of thin air, it's actually um, a collection of packages that I've seen being used across many, many projects that could be um, open source or privately in uh, different companies that I work for. And it's just a pattern that you see them all over the place and it's always a process when you try to onboard an engineer and teach those concepts to them in case they're not familiar. So if you're an engineer looking for a .NET job um, and you don't know any of them or some of them, I highly recommend that you read about them and I'm going to explain what each of them is, what they do and why you need to know about them. So first we have XUnit and NUnit. So these are two unit testing frameworks or libraries and they allow you to, to write unit tests. So that is pretty straightforward. But I personally think that you should focus more on uh, X unit than N unit because I think it's the better solution of the two. Um, it's also the one that Microsoft is officially using on their own systems. Um, th that is .NET, I mean. Um, so you know if microsoft is using that for their testing even though they have their own vs test or whatever it's called i can't remember uh microsoft test i don't know but it's it's pretty good it works a little bit different than how any unit works and it focuses on different things in terms of how the programming paradigm um goes but i think that you will write better tests by using an X unit over any unit and more predictable tests. Now, that being said, as long as you're writing tests, it doesn't really matter. I've seen both, I've seen both used well, and I've actually seen both used badly as well. Um, but I highly uh, recommend both of them, uh, especially X unit, if you're planning to write uh, unit tests. You should be totally familiar with them. Now, the next one is again on the uh, unit testing environment. Uh, we're gonna start with mocking now and the two packages that I want to recommend is mock and then substitute. You probably are already know mock, it's the most popular uh, mocking framework for .NET and it's alright, I like it, but personally I think that n substitute it's a significantly better um, library because the programming experience, the developer experience is way, 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 way better in the way they do it with extension uh, methods or, yeah, with uh, extension methods and with proxies behind the scenes so you don't even have to worry about that. As you're getting into that, you will see more of it and you'll understand why it's, in my opinion at least, better. And there's also Fake It Easy, which I don't think that many people are using. Like, if you're mocking, you're probably going to use mock or a substitute. Um, and if you are not mocking uh, in general, then you should definitely start reading about mocking because it's a huge thing in unit testing. Now, the next package I want to recommend is Poly. Poly is a package that now I think it has been uh, acquired by Microsoft in a way. Uh, at least a couple of their employees were uh, did acquire it a while ago, or something along those lines. And it's an amazing package that you can use to do retries. It's awesome it has we've covered in the channel actually and we covered um the previous packages as well it has retry policies circuit breakers bulk heads it has so so many features and i want to talk about all of them in the channel i've talked about a couple of them uh, you can find them in the top right corner of your screen right now top right corner of your screen right now I uh, highly recommend it. It will make retrying in your project way, way simpler. And I think it's a must have for every project that's trying to do anything that's in some way resilient. Now, the next package is uh, Fluent Assertions. Fluent Assertions is my um, personal choice when I'm doing uh, assertions on unit testing. So whenever you want to check that something matches something else, you can use Fluent Assertions. And this gives you the should an extension method that allows you to say this dot should dot be this value or be equivalent or match this or whatever and it gives you this english like fluency in the way you write your unit tests it's also the package that i recommend more over the uh, shouldly uh, counterpart that it has um, some other project that goes with a similar approach but it doesn't have enough nesting in how it's doing uh, testing so if you do dot should 
you see this huge list of different um, assertions that your method doesn't care about. And because you're extending the object, um, you will see it on every single dot that you're doing on every single instance of a variable. So it, I don't think it's, um, it's a great developer experience. I highly recommend Fluent Assertions. Now, the next one is called Benchmark.net. And we have covered it in this channel. With Benchmark.net, you can write benchmarks for your project and see exactly how long it takes for this piece of code to execute, how much memory it's using, how many garbage collections happen during this uh, testing. So it gives you an idea of how your code is performing. And you can compare, let's say, this and this piece of code to see exactly how um, they compete to go to the same goal uh, in terms of memory and in terms of performance. Highly recommend it. I'm using it all the time to make sure I'm not degrading the performance when I'm making a code change. Highly, highly recommend it. Now, the next one is Serilog. And this is a bit controversial because Microsoft has improved the built-in logging in .NET Core, now .NET 5. But I still think that Serilog, with all the syncs that it has and all the support by the community, it ends up being a better solution than what um, .NET has built in. The good thing is you can use the built-in iLogger interface with Serilog and have the best of both worlds, so the syncs of Serilog, uh, but also the built-in uh, iLogger interface um, with its features. Now, whether you need those features or not, it's up to you, but I do think that you should know about Serilog because it's used in so, so, so many projects. Highly, highly recommend you look into that. Now, next one is auto fixture and buggers. They're quite different in what they do, but fundamentally behind the scenes, what they're trying to do is generate fake data for your um, maybe tests or maybe you're making some seeding uh, database mechanism that creates fake data in your database. Basically, just fake data. Auto fixture is more on the unit testing side of things. So you will use it if, for example, you're trying, you don't care about the value that much or you care just a little bit and you create a factory to make the response look like something. Um, while buggers will actually have business logic related, like domain things in it, finance, um, car related things, vehicles, um, I think legal stuff, currency, pricing, whatever. And you can use that to create data that looks real, even though it's fake. While auto fixture by default, it will create just randomized uh, fake data. Both useful in different aspects. I think for a seeding mechanism, I would use bogus. While for unit testing, I would use auto fixture. But I think you should know both of them because they're both great projects. Now, next one is called Scrooter. And this is a fairly new package. I think it started back in 2018 or something. And the idea is that it extends the built-in dependency injection in .NET Core, now .NET 5, um, to have some extra functionality. And that is um, decoration but also um, registration by convention. So if the name matches in a specific way, register this interface with this class as a singleton, or if a bunch of um, classes and interfaces are in a single uh, namespace, register all of them as transient or whatever. And the idea is that this will make you write way less code in your startup.cs. Uh, but also, I, I personally love the decorate feature of the package because it allows you to decorate an already registered interface and class with something else over it. So when you're calling that from the interface, it goes first to the decoration and then deeper. And allows you to, to give, um, how, do, how should I um, say that? It allows you to give some abilities or some properties to, um, or an attribute if you want, to the, the action that you make. And for example, if you want to monitor it um, or track its performance, you can create a monitored uh, something service and decorate that over your normal one and then track there. So your domain logic for the thing that actually gets the something from the database doesn't also include the monitoring. So it separates the concerns in that way. And I think that the decorate feature is definitely the reason why I personally use Scrooter more than the register by convention. Hey everybody, Nick from the future here. As I'm editing the video, I just realized that I actually haven't talked about the next package which I wanted to, which is AutoMapper. Now, AutoMapper is mostly recommended because you should know how to work with it because many projects are using it, but it is getting a lot of criticism for being a package that can actually hide a lot of business logic in it in a layer where the logic should not be. So use it with caution. Um, that being said, I still think that there is a room for it and I actually am personally using it in some spaces. In other spaces, I'm doing my mapping uh, manually. 
it's completely up to you whether you want to use it or not, but I think you should know how to use it because it's so widely used everywhere. And that's what I want to talk about in this segment of the video. Okay, back to the video. Now, the next package is actually two packages. It's Dapper and Entity Framework. Now, say whatever you want for Entity Framework, but it is used quite a lot. And it's actually way more performant nowadays, at least Entity Framework Core, than it used to be if you're you know, if you just remember Entity Framework 6, um, amazing project. Uh, it's the reason why I have borderline forgot how to write a SQL or complicated SQL. Uh, it just makes your life so, so much easier if you're a developer. However, I don't think you should use it for everything. And this is why I bring Dapper in the discussion as well. A good way to think about it and go about it is to have Dapper to do your reads and then Entity Framework to do your writes because Entity Framework will handle all this complicated transactional stuff where you have joins and normalized data and all that going in, but going out, you probably will have simple things. So if you use Dapper for reads in the same project, you'll have very fast reads, which is usually the thing that you care about when your user is asking for a page. You don't really care about the, you know, write a comment, write a comment, the user expects it to take some time. So even if Entity Framework is slower, it won't matter. So I think you should know how to use both, but probably use Entity Framework for writes while Dapper for reads. Next, we have uh, Mediator and Brighter. Now these packages kind of do the same thing, but Brighter is a bit more opinionated than Mediator. I have personally, I'm not gonna lie, I've only seen Mediator being used, but I want to give Brighter a shout out because it's made by Ian Cooper, um, amazing engineer, and I think it's worth taking a look. I just have never actually used it because I don't really think that it gives me much more over what Mediator gives me, which is all I need uh, for my projects. Uh, but the idea of Mediator or Brighter is that it gives you this query command separation of concerns that we've talked about in this channel as well. Googling. And it allows you to have your queries or your commands or your requests in general and then send it through a Mediator and notify a handler or multiple handlers depending on which um, approach you're taking. And Brighter works in a pretty similar way. And I think that you will see Mediator way more than you will see uh, Brighter, but don't neglect Brighter. I think it's worth taking a look at. Well, next you have Fluent Validation. And Fluent Validation is similar to Fluent Sessions. It provides a fluent interface over something. And in this scenario, it's through uh, validating an object so that the properties in our object are in a specific uh, format or that the values are within range and it allows you to define domain level rules or not even just for domain, even for API contracts, like a request coming in, um, you can use Fluent Validation to validate that the object has the values that you expect it to have. We have covered this just briefly in the REST API series, and I will link that as well in case you want to take a look at that. Then we have Refit and REST Sharp. Now, these libraries both try to achieve the same goal. They want you to create a client for your API, and they're both REST API uh, centric. I think REST Sharp is more REST API than Refit, but they go about in a bit in a different way. REST Sharp gives you a fluent way to write an API client, while Refit will use code generation to create an API client based on the interface that you create. And I personally prefer Refit. I do think there's some magic involved in there, but I think that the support around it and the idea behind it is way more compelling and more interesting than REST Shop. And I also end up writing way less code. So I think that Refit is the winner here, but I honestly believe that you should take a look at both of them because they're both being used. And last but not least, I mean, you probably expected this to be in this list, to be honest. It's JSON.NET. Um, I know that Microsoft has now uh, a new JSON serializer and deserializer in the standard, but you will still keep seeing JSON.NET for a long, long time because it has so many features, been around for so many years. And even if um, James stopped working on it, people will keep using it because it's a pretty good package. It gives you a lot of features and maybe, to be honest, way too many for a JSON serializer. I've definitely gone a bit far in a few places using it, but um, I do think that it won't go away anytime soon, mainly because .NET's own serializer is lacking quite a few features. So if you still want to serialize JSON, 
maybe not as fast as you could but still pretty fast and reliably and with a huge feature set I do believe that you should use uh, JSON.NET or at least know how to use it. Now I've definitely might have missed some interesting NuGet packages or I'm just not aware of all of them obviously so if you know any NuGet package that I should know about leave a comment in the description down below and I'll take a look at that. That's all I had for you for today thank you very much for watching special thanks to my GitHub sponsors for making these videos possible if you want to support me as well you're gonna find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well and I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.